we have here. And I talk about reading probably all day long sometimes. So I'm really, really excited to be here. I'm excited to see you all as well. So I think most of you know me, but my name is Shelley Cruz. I'm the Director of Education here at Green Spring. I have been a lifelong educator, so I think I'm at 27 years now because I'm pretty old. Most of the time it's been in Montessori schools, um, but I've also worked in both public and private here in, this, in the States, and also you can probably look here in England as well. I have three children, they all grow. They were all Montessori alums and have now graduated college and out in the world doing their things. So I can remember very well what it was like both teaching my own children to read or working with my children to support them to read and working in classrooms as well. And this is something that both we're really passionate about and we're excited to share with you. Okay, these are what we're hoping are our goals for today. Because Joe and I are going to talk a lot, would anyone be willing to read them out so we get some other voices in the room today? Yeah. You leave feeling empowered to support your child in their reading journey. You feel that any questions you may have regarding the process of learning to read are answered. You have some takeaway practical ideas on how to support your child's reading and that Thank you. Thank you. So that's really what we're hoping. What we're not trying to do is help you create school at home. So we really try to think about what it's like to have small children at home and you supporting a lot of the work that's done. Is there anything in particular that's not up here that you might like to get out of today? Yeah, I'd like to get out of today is that you might be able to
What's missing when that happens is the human connection, which is so important. It's hardwired in our brain that we're going to be much more likely to want to do something and excel at doing something when we have that human being a part of the process with us and not the screen, which is an empty of emotion. So learning to read really does have a lot of emotion that goes into it, even if we don't think about that. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing I will add is Jen talked a lot about the pleasure of reading, and it's so key that that's paramount. Also, many children come up reading because they see it as information gathering, and that's important. So, although reading is, we often think of as books, there's a lot of environment, what I call, we call environmental print. So cereal boxes, road signs, shop signs, all of that, for some children in particular, one of mine was very like this, that was his step into reading. That was what he was interested in. So following your child and seeing what they're interested in, and just in a fun, pleasurable, low anxiety way, talking about the print in their world. If they're interested in the cereal box, of course, because it doesn't have to be literature. So all of those forms of print are valuable ways to help children develop that passion for reading. And not just print, but pictures too. Mm -hmm. So sometimes as adult readers, we forget the value of just a picture book that has no words that go along with it, or just objects outside of the world. We'll get into this more as we go through the different steps and stages of learning how to read, really from infancy. Um, but even just looking at an object and realizing that there is language that goes along with that object. And once the child is pointing to it with their index finger, that's one of the first things we do with the hand as, as babies. Um, we bring them to that and we say the word, the vocabulary that corresponds to that word. That actually is for all reading, even if you don't quite know that. You know it subconsciously. Okay. And feel free, if anyone has questions or comments throughout, please, we're a small enough group to jump in. So I have a question with the mirroring thing, because I, where I struggle is with my, with the kids, right? So I have a two-year-old and a four-and-a-half and they're like, Mom, how we do this? How we do that? How we do So I have no idea when they would see me reading. Do you, do you know what I mean by that? Like, at what age? Because, like, if they see me, I, I feel like I saw my parents reading a lot more than what I feel like I have time to actually sit down and read. Like, I read at night when they're asleep, but they don't ever see that. So has that been a trend you sort of heard about recently over, I mean, just with kind of the chaos of the world we're living in now, I mean, and I know the tech trend towards electronics, but I'm not even sitting there reading on my phone, it's not like they're seeing that, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm helping them, or I'm doing something, or it's just distracting, so. It's a great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. It starts right when they're born. That's, so even if you are not reading a book physically in front of them, if you're in the car and you see a guide sign, go, oh, I'm going to read that. That says stop. Even if it looks like they're not paying attention because they're so one, they're so little, they they are in a in a subconscious way. Oh, my parent or caregiver is learning from something that they read. Even if they don't have the language for that quite yet, they are picking it up at a very very young age. That's a, that's how we as human beings learn. We learn so subconsciously for the first many years of our life, like, you know, even in that first thing we develop when our mind is absorbent, we're learning subconsciously. Um, I would say, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I would say the other part of that, and I, I remember it well, I had three children under three. It was six, so I remember it very well, that, that year of life. Um, is trying to bring that, but it can be tiny snippets of time. It's not like you have to sit and read a chapter of a novel for them to see you getting the pleasure. Tiny, tiny cities. So it can be also that prioritizing sharing a book with them or just consciously saying, I'm going to sit down and read a shopping list and let them see that this is part of my daily life. Typically, it's better on a notebook or a piece of paper than a screen because they're not going to associate that screen with reading. They're going to associate it with a screen. So it's building those little parts into your day in a very busy day as a parent, I fully understand, and prioritizing that in the same way you might prioritize helping them with toilet learning or helping them learn how to be independent with shoes or whatever it is. It's, though, it's that putting that priority in your own adult brain. I'm going to pull Shannon into mm -hmm. this point. Even if, um, if, even if it's just their collection of books and you show excited about it and give a little child walking through 
spending, you know, two to five minutes. Uh -huh. Just look at what you say. Mm -hmm. You just leave it somewhere visible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be them seeing you read an adult book, mm -hmm. a recipe book, a shopping list. Yeah, all that. of those things. It's mm -hmm. really just the energy around what you're reading. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest way to do that is to take them to the library. That's exactly, so, yeah. Or in the children's section. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a chance on this book. I love the cover. It's the name. You just really draw attention to it. But it doesn't have to be one you can build it into what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. Probably with the books you already have in your collection. Because seeing you connect with the stories that you're sharing with them, that is that long reading. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I kind of try to make that a conscious effort. I have my kids, but I always have one who's the same age as your oldest. Um, and I really made a conscious effort. I put a cookbook on the kitchen table. I put um, a book of mine in his playroom. I put a book of mine on my nightstand and a different one on his nightstand. So even at bedtime, if he's fighting bedtime or not writing, I'm like, well, you can play, but I'm going to read now. Like, and then oftentimes, they're like, well, I want to read too, like, because they want attention. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to, like, even just planting them. Um, another time I took advantage of, like, bath time when they were playing. It's like, I got this great book from the library, and I'm so excited to read it. Like, and a lot of times, they're playing and listening at the same time. So even just in every room, trying mm -hmm. to... Yeah. That's great. It's perfect. Yeah, it's really having that, what I think of as like a literature, literature not necessarily meaning the, the most, you know, well-known children's literature, but a literature-rich environment in your home. Mm -hmm. You know, not just leaving it for a bedtime story. Bedtime stories are lovely. Mm -hmm. right? I'm not trying, but if that's the only time your child sees reading, it, you know, they need it in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Some children, do well with reading in the car. Some children don't. I do understand car sickness, so I'm not asking. <laughs> but you know, just having books around as part of their day-to-day -day life and seeing you interact with print is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, is there anything else? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Okay, can someone go ahead and read these quotes for us? Don't be shy. <laughs> Great. Please. Experts say that most children learn to read by age six or seven, meaning first or second grade, and that some learn much earlier. However, a head start on reading doesn't guarantee a child will stay ahead as they progress through school. U.S. News and World Report 2021. Mm -hmm. There's no particular age that one has to learn to read, but starting early provides the greatest opportunity for children's success. Okay. Timothy Shanahan, professor at the University of Illinois. Thank you. Thank you. So there is a window. You, mm -hmm. you know, we always say with language, with anything we learn new, we can, we can always learn. But there is a window really between the ages of zero to seven that are the prime time for language development and the prime time for early reading development. If you are learning or you have access to sounds for the first time only after age seven, it does get a lot harder. It gets harder to acquire a new language and it gets harder to acquire those reading skills. So this early intervention is really, really important, really even just starting from babyhood. Mm -hmm. When a child is six to nine months, they really start babbling for the first time. And that babbling is actually an early reading skill. It is the first okay. time that the child- <laughs> That's <laughs> babbling. <laughs> It's the first time that the child, if we think about it this way, is actually making consonant and vowel sounds. That is them trying to imitate language. Even if we as parents and caregivers don't pick up on that, that that's what they're doing, that is what they're doing. <laughs> um, and it's so important that we pick up on these signs. If, if they're not starting to do these milestones that we often talk about with our pediatricians, that's a time where we say, huh, is there something going on? If we see everything is you know, going great, that's fantastic. But it's so important that even at these young ages, we're picking up on these skills early. Is the child hearing sounds? Is the child able to imitate those sounds in the environment? There's a part of the brain, an area in the brain called the Wernicke's area, which is responsible for speech production, being able to hear a sound and then actually output it with, you know, in, in the brain output it with your voice. Um, 
And when a child is having these very early reading skills, that part of the brain is highly activated. It's highly activated for language. It's when everything we say as parents and caregivers and in the environment is absorbed through the mind in a way that it never will be again in the child's lifespan. Mm -hmm. So hitting those windows during this developmental period is so, so, so important. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing to think, those early years are so important. And like this said, an every child will do it slightly differently. So we're not here to stress anyone thinking, oh, I've got a six year old and they're not reading yet. So that, because each child is different and you chose a Montessori school and we follow each child individually. So, but the, this is when we know is that window. And do children learn to read after six or seven? Absolutely. Often it will take more intervention. Mm -hmm. So that's where ch things like one-on-one -on -one tutoring steps in and we have that here to support. But this is the window. The other piece I would think about is all of us innately as parents really know when we have a, an infant, a baby, to talk to them. We understand they need to see our mouths, they need to see our facial expressions. And you are the people that teach that child to speak. And then we get to reading and often we get a lot more stressy and anxious about it. It's really very similar. And when you kind of reduce that anxiety and just know that you will learn to read and your children will learn to read and you take away some of the stress because those children feel that, it becomes a much more natural, organic process. Mm -hmm. And school is here to do a lot of that alongside you. So we're not asking any of you to be the prime teachers, but I wanted to give you that, that it really mm -hmm. is something that most children will do in this zero to seven age range with your support and with the guidance of your teachers here at school. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also just to clarify what I was saying before, um, it's not that the child has to be a fluent reader by age six or seven. It, Fluency develops well over time, up until you know, 12 years old. Um, but it's, it's the initial hearing those sounds. It's exposing those children to repetitive words. It's exposing them to, well, we'll get into this more in a minute. But um, just those early, early, early reading stages, which we, we sometimes as, as adults don't even think are the early reading stages, are so important for our children. So, OK, is there any questions? Um, I have a question about the early reading stages because just last night, this <laughs> came out of nowhere. I was helping my daughter go to bed and she asked me, do all kids know how to read? And it was like, I could feel anxious. And I said, no, I said, kids don't know how to read, they have to learn. And we started, I don't, I don't know how to read. Mm -hmm. And I started, oh, interesting, tell me more. And I started with like, these are the things that we're starting with, you know, how we sing the, the song in the car and we do the sounds and like, that's the first part. Like, mm -hmm. is there, I tried to think of all of his pieces that were like, the early mm -hmm. things that she knew how to do. Mm -hmm. what, what else am I, am I missing? Because like, it kind of felt like she was feeling, but this had never come up before, so I don't know, but it just felt like she was anxious that all these kids do how to read and she didn't know how to read and I was like, okay, cool, you're free. Great, great. Um, yes. also, you, know, you know, also, like, there, there's so much that you're doing mm -hmm. that you may not yeah. read about. Can I give you one word, which I think is a really powerful word, not just with reading, but with many, many things, Jen knows which mm -hmm. word I'm going to say, the word yet. Right. So with my children, I know Shannon uses this with her children, with both the children I've taught and my own children, when they would say, I don't know how to read, or I don't know how to ride my bike, or I can't swim, or all the things that they see often older children doing, I would say, yet, mm -hmm. yet. And they'd be like, oh, she, what your, your three-year-old is not asking for you to give her a whole history of reading development from zero to seven. She's really not. You know, she just wants your reassurance that it's all okay. And just using simple words like yet and reminding her of all the things she couldn't do a year ago and now can do is, because what she's asking for is really, is everything okay? Are we good? She's not asking you to tell her how to read because we're not going to get that in one evening. <laughs> Does that, like, I think what sometimes with young children, you have to get behind what the question is and what she's asking for is reassurance, I believe, from you as her most important person. And I use that word an awful lot with children, I have I to say. Like yeah. She's asking, Does everyone just know how to read? And, and I don't. And that's, mm -hmm. I, tried, I tried that with mm -hmm. it, no, this is okay to learn, it takes mm -hmm. a long time, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yet is a really simple mm -hmm. word. I use it all the time. You don't know how to do it yet. 
And then, you, of course, you can tell her things you, you're working on. And it's really important to show your children that I don't know how to do this yet, and I'm working on it, and that's OK. So they get comfortable with that idea of we're, we're not all proficient at all the things we want to be at. I can list things that I am not proficient in, and I would love to be. And it's, it's that kind of growth mindset, helping them feel comfortable with the yet piece. Does that help a little bit? It does. Short and sweet is very good for her. For three-year-olds, it's really good. <laughs> yes. It's great. And I start with the dissertation, and she's like, yeah. Yeah. And I think we, <laughs> we, often, we often do that. And it's having that power to get inside a three-, four-, five-year-old's mind and figure out, how do I do this that makes mm -hmm. sense for them? And I don't lose them in my dissertation. It's progress, not perfection. That's another one we say a lot. <laughs> we say that a lot, too. And just to add to that, it's so if you can help it, it's so important for the adult not to show their anxiety about it in front of the child. Because then that feeling, that emotion, will just mirror right to them, more so than any verbal words or actions. So. That's a great question, thank mm -hmm. you. OK, we're going to get a little bit more now into the science of reading. We're not gonna, I'm, not, I'm gonna not try and not give you a dissertation, <laughs> but so this is the best image that I am aware of, and there are many out there, that shows you visually all of the different strands that go into reading. So this comes from an educational psychologist who works at Yale. Um, her name is Hollis Scarborough, and what she did is she, she did research on how children learn to read throughout the world. So not just the English language, but multiple languages throughout the world. And she developed this visual, um, which is I consider probably the easiest one for me to understand. And you can see that it breaks really learning to read in two big parts. There's the language comprehension, which is all about understanding what you read and uh, having some background and being able to talk about it and answer questions and think about it. And, and really, at the end, that's what gives you the pleasure from reading, because you understand it, or you get the information you want from reading. So that's a huge part. And many people get really hooked up on the other part of reading, which is the word recognition. That's really, and we're going to delve into all of these, that's really hearing the sounds, being able to associate a sound with a letter, being able to put letters together to form words, and all of that. So, and then within those, there are all these different components. And we're going to delve into all of them, actually, but mm -hmm. in not detail, but we're going to get into all of them and how they show up with young children. So that's kind of my mini science of reading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions around that? Is there anything else, Jen, I need to say? No, nope, not here. OK. I think so. So we're going to keep going. Oh, sure. Well, um, some suggestions of how you introduce metaphors and those in a very common factor because like, that's an interesting one to me for a lot of those things. Like, how you oh, with verbal reasoning here? The reasoning and mm -hmm. like, what's the easiest cues to bring into the So a So a simple answer, and we'll get into this when we get into like, when we talk about um, comprehension a little mm -hmm. bit more, but my si most simple answer at this point would be picture books for both very young children and older children. And we're going to get into it, but we have some particular picture books that I would say are pretty good at that, because a lot of metaphor for young, young children is actually not in the words. It's actually in the pictures of the story. And it's a lot about what you talk about as you're reading. And we have some good ones which we'll show you that we picked out, because we know they're particularly useful and particular authors. So I know I haven't fully answered, but can, when we get into language comprehension, if, you don't, if I haven't, or we haven't mm -hmm. answered it, please. But yeah, yeah, that's a great. Yeah, in terms of making inferences, and, and we'll talk about this again soon, um, whenever we just ask the question of, what do you think is going to happen next? Even if it's just in a picture book, what do you, mm -hmm. what do you think the picture is going to show? Mm -hmm. those, those very simple questions, mm -hmm. and the child gives you a one, one mm -hmm. word answer even, that's the beginning. Yeah. So. OK. All right. This is okay. you. So we are up to our first step of early reading skills, which is auditory awareness. So we're just going to talk about some practical things that you can do at home to support your child's reading development in this area. So just like you were saying, with the rhymes and songs, playing I Spy is a really great one. And this can be done really as soon as the child can do that pointer finger <laughs> and point at something. I spy with my little eye and first say the word a cat. <laughs> 
and then the child can point to a cat. And then as you refine that game, which winds up being a real favorite in many, in many households, I spy something that begins with k k k k k And then it's really just a game, but the child is hearing, oh, the word cat actually starts with a k, and they say, oh, cat, yes. And then you can refine that even more as the child gets to be a real expert at this game. I spy something that ends with a t. So now we're doing beginning and end sounds. It becomes a real challenge. And children seem to really enjoy that. And little do they know, they're actually developing this very important skill for how to build and break apart words once they're a few years down the road and they're up to that reading stage. Rhymes, songs, repetition. So as, so, so as we talked about before, when we sing to our children, when we are playing with them, when we are smiling and singing, we are not only exposing them to rhymes, we're not only exposing them to word repetition, but we're exposing them to joy. They love when you sing with them. They love interacting with you. They love seeing your smiling face. They love dancing with you. And again, I'm gonna go back to this because I know I, I tend to talk very openly and publicly about this, about screens. It is not the same putting your child in front of a screen and having them listen to a song on a screen or watch it. The screen does not hold the human spirit as the actual human does. And that's a huge part of Montessori pedagogy mm -hmm. also, is the, the humanity in each one of us. And when our children are watching us and interacting with us in song and dance and rhythm, they are feeling our spirit and feeling our joy. It's intangible. We can't mm -hmm. prove it, but we know it's there. Um, reading, your, reading stories with your children. You know, this is, this is such a wonderful time for cuddling and relaxing and being together. Our brain goes into that ventral state. Our, our nervous systems can also be in a state called sympathetic or dorsal. When we're in sympathetic, that's fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode, and dorsal is panic mode. We don't want our children to be in those modes. Oftentimes, we pick up on those, our children pick up on those when we ourselves are in sympathetic or dorsal mode. Um, but the reason I say this is because when our nervous systems are heightened and we're anxious or we're not comfortable, we cannot learn as well. That's actually scientifically proven that when we are in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, we cannot take in information the same way. We do, do not have ease of learning. It's only when our brain is in ventral vagal, which is that calm nervous system state of being, that we have the ability to learn our best. So reading with our children, holding them, hugging them, release, releases oxy oxytocin Tocin. <laughs> in our brain and, and creates a very safe space for our children to absorb that new information together. Mm -hmm. um, of course, pointing to words when you're reading, even if the child can't read them yet. Um, there we go with that word yet. <laughs> That's okay. It's important that they're seeing that the sounds that you're making, the words that you're saying, correspond to something that's on that pa page, mm -hmm. that's on that paper as you're flipping. Mm -hmm. um, and then Finally, of course, just pointing to objects. We have some back there that, that you guys will be able to experiment with a little bit in a bit. Um, but that's part of vocabulary mm -hmm. building too. Just pointing, this is a bird. Or this is, you know, Shannon has so many beautiful little objects. What are some of your objects on your tray? Uh, right now, uh, actually, Lynn is 12. Um, and actually, I was going to see something. Yeah. Yeah. What's If you're trying to isolate, you pick two things up. I'm, I'm thinking of an object that starts with. And mm -hmm. if they can get it right away, that's great. If they can't, just hold up one object. Mm -hmm. It guarantees success and it's going to practice vocabulary. Uh, right now, there's a telephone, a defense, a top. We try to think of that house in the right way. It's like cat, cat, yes. mat, those sort of things, because they are picking up on, on easy lines. They pick up syllables way before they are able to segment the sounds within the words. But it, it literally, you go into their toy room and just pick a couple of objects. You pick five, you pick five, mm -hmm. put it on a little tray. As soon as they stop paying attention to it, it's time to look at the objects. Right? It really could be anything. Mm -hmm. It's really fun with it. It's just kind of like, they have no idea what they're called. Mm -hmm. It's like, greater. Magnificent, amazing, they're like, yes. They 
they feel the energy of that, and they will ask you if they don't know a word, right? Often, if they don't ask you, you'll see the look. They'll say, oh, amazing, or whatever it is, you know, I'm incredulous about it. And you just explain it very simply and move on. And they start picking up, and it starts being incorporated in their vocabulary. Just because mm -hmm. they're excited about language, and they want their vocabulary increases, and it's correlated to intelligence. It just keeps going up and up and up. And up. So just flood their world with words mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and you can see how Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> what Shannon's saying about their vocabulary and vocabulary is a huge part of comprehension when you as you step into reading is so connected with this which is also like beginning to hear that sounds make up words mm -hmm. so although we looked at that image where it broke it into strands you can also saw the strands wove together because all of this is so interrelated so although we've broken it into steps so that we make sure we touch upon everything, they're all interconnected. It's not like you do this, move to next one. So I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure we're making sure that it isn't like a linear step. Your child is at step one. That's really not what's happening, but I just, we wanted mm -hmm. to make sure we were touching on this. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I would stress is you both talked about rhyming, playing games with rhyming. Children just adore rhyming. It's fun and silly. So we have a few little objects out there. We deliberately had a dog and a frog because they just love it. And singing all the songs that many of us grew up as really kind of think of as old songs like Twinkle Twinkle with the rhymes in it is so important. And Jen said it and I'm going to say it again. It's, it, when you're doing it in person rather than watching it on a screen, not only are they absolutely getting your joy, they're seeing your mouth move. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for how to actually articulate and form those sounds correctly. And that's, screens can't do that. So it's so important that you sing with them, you play with them. Nonsense words are also a really lovely thing to play with. I do a lot of playing with nonsense words with children. So dog, frog, tog. They just think it's silly and funny and they're just ex they're experimenting with sounds and you cannot do enough mm -hmm. of that. Yep. Okay, should we keep moving? Mm -hmm. Okay, phonological awareness. So this is really all about, it's, it's still auditory, I should stress. So at this point, we're not talking about letters, print letters on a page. So this is really still hearing sounds. But it's that next step where, for example, you can see on a tray here, all of the objects begin with the sound B. And then you're beginning to break them apart. So you might say, for example, you could still play a, a an I spy game, but you could say, I spy with my little eye, something that ends with the sound s. Now, I wouldn't have this many objects the first time I would do that. I would have my bus and my bed, and I would make sure, as Shannon said, they knew this is a bus, and here's my bed, thinking of something that ends with the sound s. And then, if, like Shannon said, if they can't do it, you get rid of your bed and you have your bus. It's lit. So phonological mm -hmm. awareness, again, all auditory and pulling words apart into the different sounds that they make. Mm -hmm. The one other thing I would stress here is we're, we're talking about sounds, not letter names. <laughs> and so we're not saying I spy with the, ends, with the, ends with the letter S, because that is a meaningless concept until you actually get into print. So it's all about it's auditory and it's hearing sounds. Yeah, and I, um, the only thing I would add to that is this is the time when we are looking for children to, to really make sure they're hearing sounds within words. So if I, if I just asked you how many sounds are in the word chip, can you tell me that? How many sounds? Not letters, but sounds. Can you say the word again? Chip. Chip. Three. Three. Yep. <laughs> I know. It's not, you say it with like a look on your face because as adults... We're not really thinking about, as adult fluent readers, we're not thinking about sounds anymore. But at this point, we're asking, okay, if you're going to try to find, oh, so I might say as the, as the teacher or the parent, I'm looking for b -u -t -s. What word did I just say? Boots. Boots. Mm -hmm. But breaking apart those sounds gives the child a chance to hear the differentiated sounds within the word. And that, much later on, will correlate to spelling or encoding. It is nearly impossible to spell or encode if you can't hear sounds within words. Sometimes children will be able to read a word that has more sounds in it, but it's very, very hard for them to spell it. 
because they're not hearing all the sounds. So sometimes, even at the, you know, when we get to the kindergarten age level, we're, we're looking to see, okay, does the child not only recognize the sound to symbol, which we'll get to in a minute, but can they hear how many sounds are in words? So k, a, t, three sounds. Er, a, g, which is frog, four sounds. So if a child, sometimes a child will start deleting sounds mm -hmm. once they get to the fourth sound. So one word might be clap, k, u, a, p. When we see a child is not able to hear that L sound, they say k, a, p. Nope, k, u, a, p. We want to make sure they're hearing it. Um, and it's, again, you know, it's something that as adults, we don't pick up on this very easily. We don't really think about it very much, but it, it is much, much easier for the child to eventually learn their spelling skills even way through mm -hmm. high school and into adulthood when we can ensure that they're hearing those initial sounds. So our breaking apart words for them, they'll hear that and then they can much more easily put them together later on. And I would add, I want you all to know, this is all taught at school. So we're not saying, <laughs> yes. go do this, this is your job now. Yes. Uh, but this is, so you have some understanding of what's happening with very young children at school and ways that you can play games and make it fun to support at home. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a question? We're going to do one more and then we're going to get up and look at some of the pieces. We have some practical ideas at the back and then we'll come back and keep moving. Mm -hmm. so, this may not apply to everyone. So my yeah. daughter's name is Lauren. And so obviously she can see, she knows what yep. that looks like. But mm -hmm. obviously the AU makes mm -hmm. no sense to her. <laughs> yep. So, and my other son is Walter, so it was a lot easier yep. for him to know how to spell his name. Do, I don't know, I honestly, I don't know how to just, because like the other day she said that she spelled it L-O-R-I-N. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's a phonological spelling. Exactly. Yeah. But like, what am I, I, I don't know how to like reconcile that for her of, how she knows how that might sound mm -hmm. and then what she's actually looking at. Yeah. So that's a great question. And one of the strands up here was sight words. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come into them, often called puzzle words in a Montessori classroom. Because English is not a phonological language. It just isn't. Some, or more phon phonetic language, I should say. Mm -hmm. Some languages, like Italian, are more phonetic. English is just not. And we're going to get into it. And names are a great, many, many names are a great example of that. And you, we have to explicitly teach children that. Not yet, if your child is, you know, but we're, we're going to get into it when we get into sight words. And names are, many names, English names in particular, are sight words. And it's an explicit teaching that starts typically at school. <laughs> and it's okay to say to her, you're right, English is crazy. Like, just tell her. Like, it is. It doesn't always make sense. So we start with sounds, and then in a second we're going to get into that sound symbol correspondence and how that starts. And then, yes, you have to explicitly teach children that English doesn't follow all these languages. And they kind of like it. If you kind of do it in an anxiety, I'm like, like I do it as a, like, this is kind of exciting and I'm going to tell you a secret now, but some words, and then you get into sight words and they learn them and it's really, they feel really good. Think about a word like the. You are never going to figure out the from the sound. So you just kind of give it to them like that and on you go. And we will get into it, I promise. One of our slides is all about that. We both love sight words. <laughs> Uh, quick, uh, question about like, audio books and listening to things on, on the radio and stuff mm -hmm. in the car. I know a lot of my friends do that. Is that helpful? They're not seeing the words being formed by your mouth. Like, is that, I don't like, think is that for your older children? Or? I think it's a great... I don't think it should be the only thing children should be exposed to. I think it can be great for comprehension if you're listening to it. So I used to sometimes, if we were on a long car drive, have an audio book with the children in the car, a book that was for them, and we would talk, we would listen to it for half an hour, and then we'd talk about it. That's developing comprehension, because you're talking about it. It shouldn't be the only thing, the only interaction they have with story. But I, it, in itself, is it a bad addition? No, it's totally fine. But if that's the only way they hear story, I would be concerned about that. Does that answer that question? Can we go on? I just have a question. So, we're driving the car the other day, four-year-old, he loves this one song and has his own interpretation of the lyrics are. Um, Casey Chapman, Fast Car. Oh, so, I love that song too. <laughs> so, be someone, be someone, and he hears, be some more, so and he is very excited 
by it is one mm -hmm. strange gender word. So it's not correct, but he loves his interpretation mm -hmm. and the expression we say it's something else. Mm -hmm. um, so in that situation, like do you try to focus on an comprehension piece of here's the overarching story that she's telling? Try like is that a way in? My gut, and you should share as well, would be I would just let him have the moment and enjoy mm -hmm. it. Because you can work on the comprehension pieces in so many ways. Mm -hmm. He's having fun, he's enjoying it, it's time with you, it's time listening to his favourite song. I, I personally, and I'm kind of putting my parent hat on as well, wouldn't take that away. But yeah, absolutely, you're going to work on vocabulary and comprehension in other contexts. Mm -hmm. Do you? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And there's so many songs that as children we listened to a hundred times and didn't understand the lyrics until, like, actually literally and movies. this day. <laughs> you know, and even still, I'm like, uh, it'll click. <laughs> yeah. One of the love is, um, he's so sad about language. So he tries to say what we are sad, and then you skip this up. So I love how you're talking about how you build the phonetic. Mm -hmm. But if you reverse it, any practical steps of they're saying something, you want to try and break it apart. But having positive encouragement of that practice and getting it right versus right now, there's a little bit of defensive mechanism. And you're saying, Can you practice this and then break it apart? Like he's doing something wrong. We're sort of just trying to practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's not about perfection. So if the child is motivated to practice, keep that going, keep that love going. Mm -hmm. There's things you can throw in there, you know, if, if a child is reading cat as cap, let's say, um, and you could say, oh, wow, how does that practice feel? You know, encourage the child for their practice. That's, that's the exciting part. It's not about perfection. Um, and then you can always add, okay, I'm going to read the next one. And then you read the next one. And then the child's also watching you and learning from you as you're modeling for them. So mm -hmm. yeah, nobody does anything perfect mm -hmm. first. And that's, that's a healthy thing. <laughs> yeah. I would say the other thing as a parent of young children, and I used to have to continually be reminded of this when I had young children at home, is like not get too hook, hooked in the one moment. It's one moment and they're gonna be with you for a very long time and they have all the time. Mm -hmm. So like don't get worried about a mistake or, and if you're genuinely concerned, of course, talk to your guide here, you know, like, but it's the long piece. And think about how your ch child learned to speak when they were really young mm -hmm. and they made mistakes all the time. And when children typically learn to speak and they make mistakes, we as adults tend to think it's cute and lovely and we laugh and we don't get worried. And then we start getting into this and we get, we tend to get anxious and worried and children pick up on that. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I am pleased. No, I'm not here to critique anyone, but I think we have to kind of go into our adult brain and remind ourselves of that. They're the same, they're, they're looking to you for reassurance and love and all those things all the time about this as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of important to just check ourselves sometimes I say, I would say. And it's so hard to do. Yes. It is so hard to do as, you know, I have a 12 year old now, but I, I do remember um, when he was really little, I would have a lot of anxiety about his reading. Um, he definitely picked up on it, like undoubtedly. <laughs> and you know, we had to, I had to really learn a lot as a parent of how to kind of reverse that anxiety that I was having over it to say, this is where my child is. I'm gonna embrace him where he is right now and we're gonna go from there. So it's definitely a work in progress for us as parents. Um, Cause you know, we are not perfect either. And there's no ex expectation of that. And anxiety is one of those very heavily felt emotions um, that can come out in a lot of ways. So it requires an extra level of self-reflection on our part as parents, just to, just to be aware that it might be coming out at some times in our body language and how to, if we feel tense, just take a minute, tense up yourself very, very tight and then release. That's what we do with the children. Um, and then that can relieve a lot of your own stress and anxiety so that it doesn't get put onto your children even subconsciously. So. Okay, we're gonna do one more and then we're gonna get up. I know you've been sitting for nearly an hour. <laughs> okay. okay, so I love this next step. You know, again, it's all, all goes together, but this is really when the beginning of actual reading takes place. It's really the first time when a child sees that J corresponds with a J, that A corresponds with an A. So that's what we call sound to symbol. 
And once that happens, once a child is able to recognize all of their sounds, they realize that they can put those sounds together and make words. And then once that happens, the magic of reading has exploded for them. And they realize, wow, now I can read. That means I can learn from reading. And hey, whoa, I just took two meaningless sounds and I put meaning to them. That is so exciting for the child. That wonder, that experience of, wow, now the world really is open to me in a way that I never thought it could be before. So this is my, one of my absolute favorite stages. Um, just a little, you know, when we get to vowels, I think it's, it's a lot easier to teach consonants sometimes because they are more straightforward. They're more phonetic, so to speak. The non-phonetic parts of the English language are usually with vowels or vowel teams as we call them. Um, something that we like to do, at least in our tutoring department, is we like to pair every vowel sound with a movement, a kinesthetic motion of some sort. So O, ah, circling around the mouth. E, eh, pulling apart the lips. A, ah, feeling the chin come down. I, eh, and the children's favorite is always U, uh, when you kind of like, <laughs> they like to punch themselves in the stomach. I'm like, whoa, a little gentler there. But that is, that's a lot of fun. And once you can build that word, we have k, k, a, a, t, t, k, a, t, cat, m, a, p, mop. It is so exciting for them. In our classrooms, we use the sandpaper letters um, to start forming those letters with the finger before we introduce a writing utensil. And so as children are circling that O, let's say, or forming that P, I know this is all reverse for you all, <laughs> They're saying the sound as they're doing it. Ah, uh, t, doing them in cursive. Mm -hmm. So, and then that becomes really exciting when they're ready to have that writing utensil in their hand. And not only can they now read the word made up of sounds, but they can write it too because they've had practice forming those sound to symbol relationships. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the only things I would really add are ways you can support this at home. We are not asking anyone to go out and buy sandpaper letters. They're really expensive. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, if they have them at home, they tend to be really switched off with them here. And you've mm -hmm. quite possibly heard that from guides. And as a former children's house guide, I absolutely know that is true. But there are ways you can definitely have individual letters. Children love manipulating letters. Once they're here and they're starting to have that sound to symbol correspondence, fridge magnets, Jen's fed up with me talking about <laughs> fridge magnets. I talk I about them a lot. <laughs> but they're really fun. And you know, if you're going to have them in your kitchen or wherever, get more than one set because they'll want multiple, they'll want multiple sounds. You know, they will enjoy making, writing nail forming their name. They'll enjoy making nonsense words, putting sounds together. They do not need 26, all 26 sounds before they can start doing this. You definitely want some vowels in there. And when we introduce sandpaper letters, we're making sure that we're introducing them in an order that makes sense. But make, they, and it's not about spelling. They're not spelling. They're listening to sounds and putting them together to make, to see what happens. It's fun. So that's a good one. You're going to see all of these out there in a minute. Sand trays, so how, or a, if you have a, a sand pit in your backyard with a stick, they enjoy forming those sounds and seeing what happens. That's great. All of that shaving foam. I used to do this in the bathtub with my children. I would spray some on the side of the bath, and they would make shape. You know, and they draw as well, and that's obviously fun. But also, they can start to make shapes. So there's ways to make it fun that do not feel like anxiety producing typically for either you or them, and you're not recreating school, which we're not asking anyone to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, children will often, like you said, know their letters, the sounds in their name first, so they playing with those, you know, putting mm -hmm. those out. So there's ways you can definitely do this at home, which supports what's happening here w without recreating it. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else to add? Um, do you want to show your book, or is that for? A I can definitely later? show. You mean this one? Yeah. That wasn't the next one. Oh, okay. All right. We'll go to the next one. All right. <laughs> That's a good oh. question. Oh, we did think. Is that... 
So, sometimes, no, I'm glad that you say that because sometimes we, we think in a very educator type mode and we realize that not everybody knows what these are. So thank you. Um, consonant, vowel, consonant words, and then so consonant, cat. consonant, <laughs> vowel, consonant. So the word flag would be a C, C, B, C word. F, you know. um, and then cat would be a C, B, C word. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a lot as we get into like the decoding part, which comes next, we'll talk a lot about how to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Kim. So you might talk about it later, but I've been thinking a lot about how this works in a multilingual household, mm. especially when there's another alphabet that they're learning. Do you mm -hmm. do them simultaneously, or do you, I mean, it feels like we prioritize English, and mm -hmm. how do you do it, and how does it impact the child when they're learning both? Mm. <laughs> that is a really good question. I'm no expert on, on um, mm -hmm. two languages at once. From what I do know from having somewhat of a second language in my household, um, it's introduced at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, yeah. And that can get tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know that when sometimes children go in for a speech evaluation and there is reports that there are some language delay in English, sometimes it, it, they can say, well, if there is more than one language at home, that's a reason why it might, something might appear as a language delay. Um, but it's not usually cause for concern. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think that, and again, I am not an expert either on, but I do know the science that I've read is telling us that having more than one language at that early stage is beneficial. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a beneficial thing. And obviously in our classrooms, if you're in a dual language classroom, it's not, it's not a full immersion program at all, but they're hearing two languages mm -hmm. all the time. Obviously, and there, although the alphabet, the symbols are the same, the sounds are not always the same. So there's the piece there as well. But n I am not an expert, but I do know that there's, it's, meant, it's meant to be very beneficial mm -hmm. long term. And again, it's one of those things, again, when you have to think of the long term piece as a parent. Mm -hmm. And that can be hard when you're in it with your children mm -hmm. in the moment. Yep. I'm all for teaching multiple languages at home. What a gift during that zero to set six stage of development. It's great. Do we have anyone who would be willing to read this quote, which Jen and I love, I have to say, <laughs> so it had to go in here. When I say to a parent, read to a child, I don't want it to sound like medicine. I want it to sound like chocolate. <laughs> so I hope we're giving you a little bit of chocolate because yes. we're not trying to give you medicine right now. <laughs> OK, we are going to carry on. We. Actually, again, you're going to have more time at the end should you want it to look at the materials, and hopefully some of them will make more sense as we go through this as well. So we're going to jump along. OK, this is the bit that most people are like either really looking forward to or really not, I have to say. So decoding and encoding. Decoding is really starts with your eyes. You see a written word, so the example here is bat, which is a CVC word, consonant, vowel, consonant. You say the word bat, you listen to the sounds, and then you put those sounds together, but at, and you read bat. So that's what decoding or reading is. At this point, when children are ready for this, and they do not have to have all 26 sounds, but they absolutely do need some vowels to because English, we all know, you're going to have a vowel in every word. At this point, the decoding part, which is reading, and the encoding part, which is spelling, and by that I mean phonetic spelling, not actually learning spelling rules, really come together. So spelling or encoding starts with hearing a sound, hearing a word, not seeing it written. So you would, the child would say, bat. Then they would then themselves break that apart, but at, and then they would associate with writing, or in our classrooms with the movable alphabet rather than physically writing, the sounds b, at, and t. So you can see at this point they're really coming together. In a Montessori classroom, children write before they read. So we use, and many of you who have children in children's house will be familiar with what we call the movable alphabet. A movable alphabet at home can be those fridge magnets again. <laughs> you can do both of those things. You know? So we wanted you to see how they kind of come together. Um, someone asked a really good question about when. So I can't give you an age, I can't give you a time. 
they need sound to cymbals. They don't necessarily need all 26. And that's when they're really ready for those two pieces to come together. And of course, if you have questions about where your child is, particularly because I don't know everyone's children in this detail, your guide is going to be the most helpful person. And they can talk to you about where they are on this trajectory. Often, the encoding bit comes earlier. Um, and then the reading, and what they often will do is start to reread what they've written. By written, I mean with a movable alphabet as opposed to with a writing implement. Shannon, do you want to add anything to this? Because you're in it doing this every single day. So usually the encoding comes first, and I'll the movable alphabet because it's, the movable alphabet is there before their hands are prepared and ready mm -hmm. to write. Yeah. So they have access to these sounds and they can sound out words easily. Mm -hmm. The reason that that comes before reading is because if, if they're reading these sounds and they're not sure what they're hearing, they can't So this is also, you mentioned the Bob books. So the Bob books are at the back, and I'm sure many of you saw them. They're in every single library. They're everywhere. Children love them. They are not phenomenal stories. You're not going to teach comprehension, or you're not going to extend their vocabulary. But they're really good at this stage. They're what we call decodable readers. So a decodable reader is not the same as a leveled reader. So when you go somewhere and you see, level one, step, whatever it is. And those would be leveled readers. You need a lot more knowledge about reading to step into those. A decodable reader is based on CVC and CCVC words. So it's a word that's phonetically regular. And obviously English has a lot of language that are not, hence they're not going to be great literature. However, they definitely serve that purpose of a young child going, I read a book, like a book, not just a word, not just, but a book. So it definitely serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. So Bob Books, there are many, many decodable readers. We have a list of them that we'll hand to you that you can find. They're in most libraries. And that's where they come in. Way before when you see, there is definitely some confusion around there about leveled readers being decodable. Most leveled readers are not. And you get there, but not quite yet. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions? So just a general question, like from step one through six or seven, like what's the 
age range to introduce some of these things. I know seven one for sure. Starting from zero, especially <laughs> like my older is two and a half, so I think obviously he will be too early for this. Mm -hmm. Typically, he's yeah. Probably right around <coughs> getting to the third step. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to get an idea. I would say this step, and it really differs per child. Yes. Yeah. The youngest, probably three, to the more, the older, six or seven. Mm -hmm. Seven, so I, would, a range I would say that this. if by six years old, the child is not demonstrating any understanding of this, then that's, that's reason to say, hey, we need to get this child some extra support. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also add it would be quite un an unusual yeah. three-year-old yeah. who that would be here. That would be I would like say that really, really would be young. really quite. Really young. None of my children were anywhere near this at three, and it would be an mm -hmm. unusual child. But yes, once you hit, if you think about a children's house classroom mm -hmm. being three to six, and you be, when you start to see children are ready, and Shannon can talk to this more, you know, you start introducing the sandpaper letters to some three-year-olds. Some are not ready at three. Mm -hmm. Many are, and you have to follow that child. So this would typically four, five-ish, five-ish, I would say. Again, there's a range in there, so it's really hard to kind of put a mm -hmm. spot on it. It's considered developmentally within range up until through six years old, if that's the question. Um, okay. But at Montessori, we, we expose the child to this at a very early age, so in the children's house room at three. Is that Accurate, is that what you would I say? I have a child for the full three year cycle. Um, they've come to me and I get them for that, you know, first, second, and third year total. They're exposed the whole first year to the sounds that they're not grabbing mm -hmm. the second year, say December. <clears throat> That's when I like start the remediation. And I just have to make sure that, you know, that they have their sounds accomplished by the end of the second year so they can really experience that explosion into reading and I can get them to writing. Right, because I want them to be well prepared for our elementary um, so that they can not have to rely on the Google alphabet, that they have that inner formation piece, that they have the letter placed over the writing on paper and they can express their ideas and that writing is comfortable and enjoyable for them. Right, so we have a lot to accomplish in those three years. If there's not traction that first year, it's the highest priority uh, for the second year. If I'm still having difficulties by December, it's not really grabbing. That's when I'll grab Jack. Um, do we have room on the tutor roster so that they can get a little extra support when like it's a daily practice between, you know, they're getting that daily practice in the classroom, they're getting tutoring at least once a week, mm -hmm. but it's in the absorbent mind phase from three to six. Sometimes the learning feels effortless for them, mm -hmm. right? Now, reading's not like that for everyone. Some children, they just, they really make it look effortless every push. <coughs> Some other children, like, walk up the mountain, they feel every step. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to smile at them, coach them through it, keep the sessions brief, right? Get that high repetition so that they really <clears throat> are getting targeted practice with those sounds that are going to mean the most for them. But we have the luxury of time. You have know, three years of Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we accomplish and we have this yeah. ability. <clears throat> Yes, and I would add to that, here we are probably more on the proactive side than yeah. other environments. Yes. So, you know, some, some people would look at me and say, that's, that's crazy to even say that a three-year-old could potentially, you know, start this kind of work. But for us, because this is so much a part of our culture and our, our methodology, it's, it's very typical. But, you know, you, you wouldn't have necessarily a preschool age teacher like Shannon seeing a four-year-old student in their room saying, this child can't hear sounds yet. So in, in some other environments, it might not even be detectable. Mm -hmm. But here, we just see it really, really early. And we jump in very early so that by the time the child does get to elementary school and beyond, they're ready to go. And those foundational skills are all solid in there. Mm -hmm. So, The only other thing I'd add as a recently el lower elementary teacher, so six to nine-year-olds, is this continues into those years. Mm -hmm. So children come up into first grade at a whole range of reading. Some were still working in that first grade world with but at bat. Some were reading virtually Harry Potter, not necessarily comprehending it, but they're reading it. So there's that, those years, first through third grade, which is where I spent most of my career, that's where you have a range like this with reading more than any other subject that I've ever experienced. So, and all of those children go on to be readers. I've yet mm -hmm. to have one where they did not read. 
Right. Jackie. <laughs> I remember when I was in school, there were clearly different reading circles. There was like mm. the mm -hmm. ones who really struggled, the ones who were in the middle, and the ones who were like high achievers, right? Mm -hmm. I'll be real with you, I was in the middle. Do you ever find that those who are at the bottom of the packing, let's say first grade, ever get out of that pack and like unleash, or are they always typically struggling and at the bottom? That's, That's a great question. And my quick answer is yes, they get out of that pack. Yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. They may need more support, and that often here falls under tutoring, which gives them that one-to-one -one or sometimes two-to-one, depending on the child. But, so they may need more of that, but yes. So when you go and you look in an upper elementary, upper elementary classroom, which is nine to 12 year olds, fourth through sixth grade here, I get to see that with the children mm -hmm. that I knew. You know, I needed to put a lot of support in when they were in first, second, third, and now I'm like, look at them go. And so, yes, I do see that. Sometimes it may not be their favorite thing, but they are fluent readers, yes. I can't say on, they go on and want to read War and Peace, and you know, it may not be their love, but yes, they are fluent readers. Does that answer that, Jackie? Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. Okay. And just to acknowledge, I think many of us experienced that, the low, middle, high. That's not a great system. Mm -hmm. just and they general. don't and I, you know, experience that here. <laughs> they do not experience that here. And that's, you know, when I was coming here, that was something unique to me coming from traditional school for so many years, um, was that it's, it's not detectable in our rooms mm -hmm. who is where and who is doing what. And it's not a bad thing if you're in the quote unquote low circle because everybody learns at their own pace and that's good that's healthy it's not just okay it's expected <laughs> you know we're human beings we all learn differently we don't all you know graduate high school and do the exact same path as everybody else we all have di we're different and that starts as soon as we are young and as soon as our spirit as human beings starts to develop so okay so this is that sight word piece that we were talking about earlier so sight words, sometimes you'll hear the language puzzle words really acknowledges that English is not a phonetic language. Um, it's actually not as non-phonetic as we often think. I thought I found that I need to read this statistic because I don't have it in my brain and I found this useful. It's only apparently four words in the English language that are fully irregular. So 4% four, four of words, not four words, 4% four, four of words. <laughs> That didn't help me reading it, did it? Four percent of words <laughs> that are actually fully irregular, which I found pretty surprising, particularly mm -hmm. as I've spent my entire life doing this stuff. Yeah. So, but there are many words, and you can see some of them here: the, my, said, and they're those words that children need to, that you know, in the most simple picture books and level readers they're going to need. Mm -hmm. So the key is we teach them. We just, we just, we don't expect them to. Ex they're not going to discover this on their own. You actually have to explicitly teach it. And we step into that as teachers. And this is where, so, you know, we start here with, we don't introduce letter names first. We introduce the sounds first. Mm -hmm. This is the point when the child is ready to learn letter names when mm -hmm. it comes to sight words. So, you know, just saying the word the, many children who don't know sight words yet, we'll read that as t h uh. And they're like, what is that? <laughs> if they get that and said, this is a common one that you yep. see in the decodable readers. Sa-a-id, sa -a -id. <laughs> But then they figure it out based on the context of the book. They love it. But this is an area, you know, and I will just say when I taught in traditional kindergarten, non-Montessori, um, and we would first learn letter names um, that went along with sight words, we would often pair them. T-H-E, the, that's considered arm tapping. Believe it or not, little, li even though that one sounds more phonetic, but it, it is considered a sight word. Mm -hmm. L-I-T-T-L-E, little. And then the children would have the best time learning that, mm -hmm. you know, paired with the kinesthetic motion. They would love it. Um, and then eventually with the sight words, they say in the brain it takes about four to 30 exposures, yep. I believe, to yep. see that word before it becomes automatic mm -hmm. and you don't actually have to process it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to remember for a, for a little person who is just learning how to read, every time they see that word, the, until they understand that it's a non-phonetic word, they're going to, he, eh, <laughs> and they're, they're trying to figure it out mm -hmm. based on context. But um, 
So yeah, this is when letter names. So really letter come names come play. in. And also I would say if you have a little, a child who's doing the t eh, just give them the word. Mm -hmm. Just get like, do not, like that struggle isn't useful because they're not right. gonna discover anything. So you just tell them, that word says the. And usually when I do that, I'm like, it's so crazy that it, those sound, those letters don't make the sound. Children generally find that pretty interesting and actually quite funny, and they don't have the anxiety about it if we show them that. Mm -hmm. There's a great way to do this at home is games. So think oh, of a game the, like we have the some over there. there. So the Zingo game at the back, typically most mm -hmm. kindergartners, first graders love that. Mm -hmm. They're all over that. Um, even games like Jenga, like you can get just a regular cheap Jenga and then write sight words on it. And when you pull it out, you read the sight word. It's just making things fun. Having a ball and writing sight words on the ball. And then when you, where your hand touches, you read the sight word. As long as it's fun and it doesn't feel like I'm gonna, we're going to sit here with flashcards and just keep showing them to you until you've got it, they're going to do it. They, they will do it. So it's fun. Movement is good. The arm tapping. One of my own children used to do this on a trampoline. I don't think, we just, he just loved a trampoline. So we just learned, like he also learned his math facts on a trampoline and whatever it takes. So it doesn't have to be sitting at a table with flashcards, which is possibly mm -hmm. where how lots of us, we may not remember it, but you've got to like, you've got to meet the child where they're at. So if the child that movement's important, mm -hmm. bring in movement, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you have, what do you do, Sharon, with what all of this? What do you in the classroom do, just like we do with any vocabulary, three concepts at a time, so we believe the, my, and then the concept that we're trying to get in the classroom? Who's that? Over here, hands me the. Who's that? Mm-hmm. That's what we're providing the vocabulary. We're providing the vocabulary, and the third period is, is that uh, they can say, if they mastered those three in the first sitting, we can move to three more. Yeah. But with any concept, you don't want to introduce more than six at a time because they reach a saturation point. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to be able to have these visible. So I just put, uh, Painter's Tape is your best friend <laughs> because you can have that at home. It's great for sewing projects, if you're sewing with burlap, you can you know, put things up there, simply take them down without breaking the paint. But if you make them visible, and just an area could be you know, in the bathroom, they're brushing your teeth, they're on the front of your fridge. They see them, they'll say them, they'll, you know, you can name them as you go by. They just pick them up. And I've been talking to a lot of parents about the concept of three practices. It works with everything. Mm -hmm. The first time you try something new, it, it's going to feel a little unfamiliar or clunky. If it doesn't, it means we waited too long to teach the concept, right? So there should be a little bit of a reach when you're introducing something new. That second time, you're going to activate that memory, you're going to have that familiarity. But the third time, you're going to be feeling pretty great because you remember it and you're ready to move on. Mm -hmm. But with any of the practices, they're going to see these high frequency words in, in all the phonetic books, in the decodable books, um, and they're going to see it so much, it's just going to become part of their lexicon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, just keep it fun. Mm -hmm. keep it keep, yeah. yeah, I think that's the key. If you're reading aloud to your child and they're open to it, and you come across a sight word, you, if, and again, if you're open, you don't want a, your bedtime story to become, I'm going to teach you how to read moment. That's not what that's about. But if they're open to it and you know they've got the, they can read the, or they can point to the every time. It's going to come up in any book you're reading to them. <laughs> so as long as you keep it interesting and fun and follow your child and they'll show you when they've had enough mm -hmm. and it's not time for that. That's the key with this. And, you know, the, the goal or... It's that is most children will end their kindergarten year, so the end of children's house, with approximately 30 sight words under their belt. We are going to share with you. We'll send them to you. We'll send you the sight words so you can see what they are. They are, you know, these are some of them. <laughs> it's going to be those frequently occurring words. And then they, we keep building them. So they build through their lower elementary years. You know, we add more each year. Some children just innately, once they start, they just got it, just because they're reading more and more and the, you give them the word, they got it. You know, so it does tend to many, many children get quicker, but at the beginning, yeah, it's really explicit teaching and then exposure. Mm -hmm. Some of them are phonetic and... That's the other thing I should have mentioned. Par yeah. Partially Part, phonetic. Some, so a word Otherwise like, it wouldn't be a sight yeah. word. So if you think of a word like what, the mm -hmm. question word what, at this point, the child will probably have been introduced to WH always makes a W sound, so they know that. And the T 
this phonetic. So I, when I teach what, I point that out. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's kind of a sight word, but there's a lot we know, and they love that, because it's like, oh, we're figuring out. So there's the w and the t, and the only piece that doesn't make its regular a sound is the a. And then just giving them that kind of verbal, you can almost see them taking on, and it becomes their internal voice. So mm -hmm. what is a sight word, but we know a lot about it. <laughs> and yeah. you know all of those pieces, because that's really what we mean by most words in English are not fully irregular. They have mm -hmm. bits of both in them. So, yep. Okay. Is there any questions about sight words and all this? Okay. Okay. So it's you. Do you want to? All right. One? Sure. All right. So once we have a, an ability to encode and decode, and um, you know our sight word recognition, this is now the time when we start, to, we, we're going from learning to read to reading to learn. Mm -hmm. That's what I often say. Um, and once a child is now reading to learn, they've got those foundational skills there, they are, they are taking information that they're learning from their texts and now they're able to do research from it. They're able to realize, oh wow, now that I can break down and put together those sounds, I can gain meaning, not just from the word itself, but the words that come together. And this is the point in which a child will be starting to be exposed to grammar. They'll be exposed to expression in reading, so an exclamation point. You know, when a child, this is, this is now by the time the child's in no, first Typically or elementary. Grade, no, elementary. Yeah. We will start reading with a lot of expression in our tone for a question. What is the dog's name? To make sure that they know that's a question. Um, with a lot of feeling. So <clears throat> when we get to vocabulary and comprehension, we are now learning new words from a text. We can be learning them explicitly, or the child can guess what that word might mean, making inferences based on context. So the child might know, you know, here we have two of our students, I guess they were learning about dogs that day. So they might not know what type of dog they are reading about, but they're gonna see the name of the type, of the, see the name of the dog and realize, oh, okay, this must be the species of blank or whatever it is. And um, they're learning that because the previous few dogs they had read about in the book were about the same thing. So they're making inferences and um, they learn a lot of new vocabulary just from that. Mm -hmm. I would so. say the other thing here that I found really useful as children kind of get into that kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all around that area, is using wordless books, which sounds counterintuitive and we have some wordless books out towards the end. Wordless books are really powerful for developing comprehension skills because there are no words to rely on. And I use wordless, when I've taught fifth, sixth graders, I've used an awful lot of wordless books because typically children of that age have got the decoding part down, they, they can read. But some of them are still struggling around comprehension. So to comprehend a wordless book, you really have to think about the story. You need a lot of vocabulary and you introduce a lot of vocabulary. You need a lot of background information. So we give them the background information. So wordless books are really powerful. The other thing that we have out there that I'm gonna mention are books by Jan Brett. That's the author's name. So many of you probably know stories like The Mitten. They're beautiful picture books. So you can read the story and talk about the story and it's fun. And then in the border of all her illustrations, if you open any one of them up, she has another whole story going on in the border just through pictures. That's a great way to develop comprehension because your child has to tell the story and you obviously talk with them. It's not, tell me the story. You know, you have a conversation. They're developing background information. They're showing, do they know beginning, middle, ending? Can they talk about inference? Can they make an inference? That's where things like metaphor can come in because you talk about really complex things but without worrying about the decoding and the sight word mm -hmm. part of reading because these are really big skills and it takes an awful lot of brain power. It's really hard. So sometimes taking the pressure off to allow them to work on both of those skills. So I would say that picture books and wordless books should be used way, way, through, I mean, right up until sixth grade. I do not remove, I've had upper L classes and I had all of these things going on. So you want children to be able to retell stories, tell you why do you think the author did that? What's going on here? Like all of that is really important. And when children will come across things in text, like let's say, let's say her hair was a ribbon of curls. So does that actually mean that the child's hair was a piece of ribbon that was curly? 
No, they're learning for the first time what those expressions are, what that means. And they're learning that not everything in, in language is literal. Mm -hmm. So they learn that a lot from, from books in this stage. You know, something we can ask our children, you know, when, when we have really older elementary students in tutoring, we will ask them after they read a passage, can you repeat back to me what happened? Or what do you think is gonna happen mm -hmm. next? Or, um, you know, if you were the character, if you were in the character's shoes, what would you do? So making the book, the, whatever they're reading, relatable to them as human beings. That's a huge part of comprehension. Mm -hmm. When the child can relate to the passage in a personal way, their brain actually gets activated to really want to pay attention more, to want to know more, mm -hmm. so. A good, and one last thing I will say is that a good way to work on this with slightly younger children is you can get um, sequencing cards. You can get three cards, with, they're just pictures, there's no words. So it could be a three-step sequence or a four-step sequence. So it might be the story of making a sandwich. And a young child, a three or four-year-old, will put them in order. So first I get my bread, then I spread my peanut butter, and then I put, you know, so, and then they orally tell you the story. In doing that, they're working on story language, they're working on comprehension, they're beginning to sequence. So all of that comes into this and then just, it just keeps going. This really doesn't end. So if you're a high school teacher, you're still working on comprehension. We are still working on our comprehension. So it's a never ending process that we just keep building. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're nearly at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and our, our last step as we've broken it down um, really is fluency and automaticity. So what that means, fluency is when something is read nice and I would say fluidly. So there's no unusual pauses or breaks in between reading the passage or the words. Um, but I don't wanna have that confused with speed. Many parents, when, I, when we sit in meetings, they think, well, does that mean speed? And I'm like, absolutely not. You can be a fluent reader and read really, really, really slowly, and that's okay. What we're looking for by this stage is that the child can look at a sentence, look at a paragraph, and be able to read it without those pauses, without those breaks, without needing to, to um, break down the words in their head, just looking at the words and being able to read it. Um, automaticity is, you know, with those sight words that we were just talking about, you can just look at the word, no longer have to process it at all. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes automatic for you. Um, and this is a skill that really children work up through, even, even to high through. school, like yeah. all the way through. Um, <clears throat> and it's really exciting once we reach this level of fluency and automaticity because this is the point in which we can learn the most from reading now in the world and in life. Um, and this takes a while to get to, it's different for everybody else, and that's okay. But I always say the biggest, the biggest thing to realize is it's not about speed because so many people just want to race to the finish line. Mm -hmm. Children want to race to the finish line. And you know, we'll say, mm, we're gonna actually start that over because what happens is you wind up skipping words if you're just trying to speed, you wind up saying the sounds wrong. We'd much rather accuracy over speed. And also so. that's linked to comprehension. So the mm -hmm. number of third graders that I've had read, me, read to me super fast and I'll let them finish and I'll say, oh, tell me what that was about. And they'll look at me like, I have no idea. I just read it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's that piece as well. And that's okay. That's real. That's not a problem. That's, that's very developmentally appropriate. And my job as a third grade teacher then is to slow them down and to, oh, let's read it again. Let's maybe read it a sentence at a time and then think about it. Have we got like, is there any, do we understand other words? Do we have any questions? So it's that piece as well there. Mm -hmm. Of course. Strategies around this, you know, this, this idea that they want, they want to finish something or they, they want to move on to the next step. And I think mm -hmm. also like with level readers, you know, it, it, it is kind of this like, I want to level two. Like, <laughs> you know, like there's, mm -hmm. there's that aspect of it. So mm -hmm. what are strategies to either embrace that or, you know, how, how should you approach that? So I, there, I would say it's twofold. I think as parents, we can actually model us slowing down. Mm -hmm. So and rereading so, so often. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, well, I, I go back to mirror neurons and modeling. Just it really in a lot of workshops because it 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 actually makes a really big difference for our children. You know, I mean, one of the things I I, I teach piano lessons, um, and when a child is just going quickly through the piece, they often make many many mistakes. I will then actually say, okay, I want you to listen first, 
and then I will play it very, very, very slowly. Um, and then once they hear somebody else doing that, then they can, something in their brain activates and they naturally try to copy the way that you're doing it. Um, so that's one thing. In terms of if you're trying to, you know, your child's gonna be not motivated if they can't feel like they can go through it. I would say there are times when you, you, you can let it go, but then mm -hmm. when you're doing more serious learning and you're doing, let's say, I mean, we don't have homework here, but if you're ever doing a project with them that really requires that concentration, um, you could say, hmm, I don't think I understood. You as the parent say, I don't think I understood that. Did you understand that? So it's not just about the child, it's about you too. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say. I think the other thing is, as children kind of step into this point, they're, re they're reading, I have always, and I had to work on this as a parent as well, made sure that you, there are, you let them know there are different books for different purposes. We innately know that as adults. So when I go on vacation, I am not going to read a heavy Montessori text because I don't want to do that then. I might read some ridiculous, you know, cheap literature that I bought in the airport and that's okay. It's okay. And it's also okay for children to do that too. Like they get to do that and there's another book where you may be sitting and reading with them and you're working on comprehension because you're talking about it. It doesn't always have to be like the teachable moment. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? So there can be, my children, loved some books that I didn't really like and it was, it, they're fine, it was okay. Mm -hmm. I chose not to necessarily share those books with them and that was okay too. And there were books that we shared together and we got different things from. Because they're really figuring out what they like and what they don't like. And so some books they can race through and you don't have to necessarily get into it. And then other books you're gonna spend more time with. Does that help a little bit? I just, I think it's really important, especially as guides, as teachers to know that it's, it's sometimes okay to read a book about Barbie, a leveled reader on Barbie that I would not want in my classroom, but it's okay, nothing bad will happen, it's okay. And you kind of have to know that we do that as adults and it's mm -hmm. children, are, that's okay for children too. Does that, yeah. yeah, okay. So we've said here, let's practice again, but we're actually gonna do that at the end because we wanted to get to make sure we've finished in a timely fashion. Um, so, would anyone be willing to read this quote? And then we have a few things we wanted to share with you as well. On days when I felt I have nothing left to give to my parents, I've been able to sit next to them and open the book. We start reading in a whole world of different. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> that's really if we give you nothing else. I hope you can take that away. At this point, so the author of this, Maria Russo, is from this book here. So. I do not know her, <laughs> I'm not getting, this I found on Amazon, I bought a copy, Shannon and Jen both know this, it's really good. It's aimed at parents, it's not aimed at educators, so it doesn't get into the science of it, but it takes you through supporting your child from zero all the way through to their teenage years. It cost me five dollars. I don't know why, I wonder if they like build me incorrectly, because on the back it says 20, so I'm just, full disclosure, <laughs> I don't know. It's really good. Also, what's, it, it talks about a lot of the things we've talked about. The other thing in here that's really useful is it gives you, as you go through the ages, recommendations of books. And it does it in terms of, so I'm just gonna randomly put, open a page. Family stories, so if you wanted stories on families, it gives you books. Um, it gives you authors to look for. It tells you books that are good for certain things. So if you, your child was going through something, I don't know, they were, Scared of the dark, I'm just, you know, it gives you books on very common childhood things you might want to find a book on. So I, I bought this and I, I cannot say I've read every word, but I have definitely skim read it and spent an hour with it. It's good and I would recommend it and it's not expensive. So I wanted to kind of give a plug for that one if you wanted an adult guide. Mm -hmm. That's great. Are there any questions at this point? We're about to wrap up. <laughs>
practiced it three or four times. They came ready. They like gave a presentation and read to the other children. I've had two other children do it this year too, because they want to show off their skills. And these are books that they can relate to, that tickle their funny bone, that they really love. And watching the three to six-year-olds look up and you know smiling at them and connecting to them, like it is possible for them to make it out of that lowest level. They just need more support, and then things start to even out, right? So it's possible that you know the practice they could do it in two years. It's not you know a decade long or something like that. Sometimes it, we can course correct it. Pretty Mm -hmm. Right, because sometimes it, the obstacle is um, mindset and it's resisting that practice because it feels difficult. So you have to warm up to the idea. Others, you just have to build a skill and then you find something they can really connect mm -hmm. with. So I really love the Willems for this age group. They took all their funny bone. The Pinion Elephant books <laughs> are super easy to remember, like you read them a few times. The, they gave great picture clues and then they can be reading them to you in no time. That's going to build that fluency, that authenticity, mm -hmm. that cipher recognition. And it might be something like it's not the most highbrow literature. They're hilarious and they will tickle your phone mm -hmm. and they'll remember them. Mm -hmm. So, and you don't have to buy a whole set, like you yeah. utilize your libraries. And it's so powerful when a child, even they can do it here, they can do it at any local library, get a little library card with their name on it yeah. and teach them how to be responsible with mm -hmm. those. But to see that responsiveness of saying, this is, I want to book about astronauts. I want to book about mm -hmm. comments. And, and they make their own relationship with the librarian. And it's another adult in their life, besides the teacher, besides the parents, besides your grandparents, neighbors, family, friends who are talking to books about books with their children. And they develop their own relationship. It's pretty special. Thank you, Shannon. So we're about to finish out. We were going to ask you, as we always do, for some feedback. How we do that here is we talk about roses, buds, and th walls. So roses are pieces that were useful to you, you enjoyed. Buds, we think about things that maybe you wanted to learn or we didn't touch upon. Is there something we could add when we do this again? We're always learning to, we're always hoping to learn ourselves. And thorns, places we could improve upon. We're trying to come at this with a growth mindset. So we're about to pass out post-it notes and some pens, or you may have them. If we ask you to just put a rose, a bud, and a thorn, and we can put them here. I, we then have two pieces here. This is really what we've done. This is a real summary of what we've talked about. So you've got each step there. We will not be offended if you don't want these, but it's there if you'd like it. And then here, with the steps, practical things you could do at home. Um, so if I pass the, if you pass it at the beginning and maybe over there and you take one and pass them along and feel free to look at anything at the back, ask us questions mm -hmm. and thank you for coming.